I want a big warm welcome to all of you, and I want to start by thanking my students. Um, this is one of the great honors of my life. I don't think there is any bigger honor than being appreciated by people that you respect, and my respect for my students is profound. When I was 10 years old, I recall reading about James Meredith and wondering how any human being could have that kind of moral courage. It is an amazing dream to be on the same stage as him. <laughs> 26 years ago, I graduated from this school, and I was sitting where you are, and I was happy and proud, but I was also anxious. A lot of people had told me that my 20s would be the best years of my life. And remember thinking that if this was true, I was in deep trouble. <laughs> when I was 25, I had not yet figured out either love or work, what Freud calls the two most important things in life, and I was pretty much of a wreck. Nor is my view of the future especially bright. We live in a culture that tends to be obsessed with the young, and we don't seem to find much good about getting older. Romance will drip away. Work will drone on our passionate, youthful idealism will be drowned out by cold realities. The problem with all these alleged trends is that they're simply untrue, they're myths. This descent happens, of course, to some people. But this cultural story doesn't describe my experience. I can say without question that every decade of my life since I was 25 has gotten better. And this cultural story certainly doesn't need to describe your experience. Most importantly, and this is what I want to focus on today, there are things that you can do to write a very different story. I didn't develop, and I don't think many people develop, their most important qualities until midlife. In particular, life can become better because we can learn how to love in many different senses of this very misunderstood word. I study romantic love, and I want to start with romantic love not only because it's so important for its own sake, but because the capacities we develop in our romantic relationships can be so central to our abilities to be effective teachers, parents, counselors, and colleagues. I also think that developing mature, healthy romantic relationships and effectively counseling young people in developing these relationships requires taking on squarely our culture's damaging obsession with young love and some very wrong-headed cultural ideas about what love is. We are infatuated in modern times in this country with young love. Our songs and our movies, think about any movie Jennifer Aniston or Rachel McAdams are in, are about the intoxication of, of young love. If you are a really lucky teenager, you can be totally swept off your feet by a vampire. <laughs> and, the, and these images tell us that every stage of love, that, that the early stages of love are not only the peak stages of love, but the most wonderful, pure, transcendent times of our lives. Young love can, of course, be absolutely wonderful. But there are reasons why the Greeks and many other cultures have thought of young love as a form of madness or an illness. And there is much about these modern images of love that can utterly misguide young people at every stage of their lives about what real love is and how it develops. I think modern movie images of love have, in fact, done far more damage than movie images of violence. Both our movies and our popular songs often equate attraction and infatuation with real love, and they make flying into an infatuation seem courageous. But we can be deeply infatuated and attracted to many people we can't have healthy relationships with, and infatuation is only one of many types of love. These songs and movies suggest that love is about fulfilling one's own needs, not about how we might need to change to be able to really love and be loved by someone else. They suggest that we should hang on to love even if we are degraded. As Justin Bieber puts it, I'll buy you anything, I'll buy you any ring, I'd go hungry, I'd go black and blue, I'd go crawling down the avenue. <laughs> I think I may be the first person in ed school history to quote Justin Bieber. <laughs> Strange as it may sound, I'd rather my 17-year-old daughter, daughter learn about love from Tolstoy or Toni Morrison or Elizabeth Barrett Browning than from Justin Bieber. <laughs> the older adults I know have, who have succeeded in love have figured something else out. They have different metrics. 
It's less that they have different feelings than they interpret those feelings differently. Many of these adults see love not as a preoccupation or as an infatuation, but as having the kind of deep trust and faith that allows them not to think about someone else all the time. In this way, real love enables them to give to those outside their relationships, to be better parents, educators, men mentors, or generative in many other ways. Rather than seeing all the ways that their partner fails to meet their needs, they deeply appreciate who their partner is, and they're aware of their own flaws and work to reduce the harm these flaws can do to those they love. Rather than fretting about the loss of intensity of young love, they're able to experience many kinds of deep love at different stages of their life. When I said I love my wife on our wedding day, I meant something very different and much thinner than when I say, I love, than when I say to her, I love you today. At the same time, adults in these successful relationships never let themselves be degraded or subordinated. They know that any relationship in which you are the means to someone else's narcissistic ends is not a relationship at all. As Martin Luther King said, I cannot be what I want to be unless you are what you are, what you ought to be, and you cannot be what you ought to be unless I am what I ought to be. Developing these relationships is not, of course, simple. Many of you will have relationships that fail and you will have to restart. Some of you will decide not to have romantic relationships at all. But if you can undertake the delicate, subtle work of really learning to some, love someone else, and if you are thoughtful about how you measure love, you can experience kinds of love that are startlingly real and infinite and true, and in their quiet way, absolutely dazzling kinds of love that can in turn enable you to guide young people in the real courage and discipline of developing self-respecting and generous love relationships. And much of what is true is about developing caring romantic relationships is true about developing our close relationships in our work, our relationships with the children we teach or counsel or mentor, and our relationships with our colleagues. How we care and love in these relationships is surely as important is our level of content knowledge and our technical expertise. Perhaps most important, as we get older, we can learn not just the easy but the hard forms of love and care. We can learn to empathize for many kinds of children who are very different from us. How to care for children who irritate or even infuriate us. How to shield others from our damaging moods. How to see clearly how a child sees us. How to hold in our head a complex story of another human being. And if we are careful and attentive, we can learn a great deal about how to care and love from children themselves. In my research, I talked to a teacher who said she learned about respect and fairness by watching how effectively a 10-year-old student navigated conflict in the classroom. And I heard from a father who said he learned empathy by watching his 12-year-old son. My students have taught me to see the blindnesses of privilege and many hidden forms of racism and sexism and homophobia, as well as how to appreciate very different religious and political views than my own. I have learned from my students how to praise and criticize, how to talk in ways that allow others to really listen, and how to listen in ways that allow others to truly speak. One reason I love my students is they don't tend to measure their worth by status or wealth or all the other nutty ways people measure their value in this country. You measure your value by your value to others. You go to sleep at night asking yourself whether you actually helped the child or developed a technology or reformed a policy that enhanced learning in another country or helped to stop an injustice. And I have such great hope that your lives will become more gratifying as you age because I know that status and wealth are often false idols and the capacity to measure your life in terms of your value to others is in itself a profound gift. Because of this gift, you don't need to buy into the story that idealism evaporates over time. You can experience many forms of idealism throughout your life that are deep and earned and even at times spiritual. Idealism that is also in its quiet way dazzling. Finally, let me mention one other kind of joy and meaning we wrongly associate with the young. We think of youth as a time of wild, exhilarating freedom. But the reality is there is a far more ki important kind of freedom 
that we can exercise at any time in our lives. The writer David Foster Wallace talks about this kind of freedom. We all have the freedom, he says, to be lords of our tiny skull-sized kingdoms, alone at the center of all creation. But the kind of freedom that is most precious, Wallace adds, you will not hear much talk about in the great outside world of wanting and achieving. The really important kind of freedom involves attention and awareness and discipline and being able to truly care about other people and to sacrifice for them over and over in myriad, petty, unsexy ways every day. So let me thank, say again, thank you for this wonderful honor. And please know when you feel isolated or defeated, when you see only darkness and hear only deafening silence about things that outrage you, that you are not alone that many members of this community have now locked arms with you. Keep fighting the fight, stay in the fray, take care of yourselves, make sure to meditate or go to the gym, make sure at times to honor your inner couch potato, your inner slacker, and please keep seizing the freedom that David Wallace describes, the freedom to care and focus and sacrifice and deeply attend. That kind of freedom is the basis of an ethical life. That kind of freedom is the core of love in every meaningful sense of the word. And that kind of freedom is the best way I know to spend your one breathtaking time on this earth. Thank you very much.